White Otter Castle is the most unusual log building in Canada. It springs from the ground as part of the landscape, a lonely sentinel beside a pebbly beach on White Otter Lake in northwestern Ontario. The castle is a monument to its creator, Jimmy McEwitt. Jimmy was a giant in spirit, if not in size. He had to be. The logs are massive. He wrestled them into position all alone. Single-handed and single-minded, he transformed a dream into reality. Jimmy kept no diary. It's the castle's air of mystery and romance that triggered stories that he was an eccentric, a hermit, even a king, that he built the castle for a woman, a bride, a lost love. These stories have earned Jimmy McEwitt a secure place in folklore. The legend of White Outer Castle began during Jimmy's lifetime. In 1914, a journalist named Hodson visited him at the castle. When Hodson asked the reason for building such a unique structure, Jimmy told him about a curse uttered half a century earlier, a thousand miles away. Years ago. Yes, it's a long time now. We was just boys, you know. I, I had a chum, we, we, one of those jolly lads, always playing some prank. And one day he throws an ear of corn at another man. <laughs> it hit him in the ear. <laughs> he was a bad-tempered chap. Oh, my, how he swore. He didn't know who threw it. No, but he thought it was me, and he cursed me. Said I'd die in a shack. Jimmy McEwitt, he says, you'll never do no good. You'll die in a shack. Oh, I never forgot it. All the time I've lived in a shack, and I kept thinking I must build me a house. And so I have. You couldn't call this a shack, could you? Jimmy McEwitt was born in 1855, the youngest son in a large family. He grew up near Brownsburg, Quebec, on the family homestead. The first McEwitts came to Canada as stonemasons to work on the Rideau Canal. Others followed. Together, they pioneered the Brownsburg area north of Montreal in the Ottawa Valley. It was here he developed qualities that dominated his adult life. Skill at building with logs, a capacity for hard work and pride in his Scottish ancestry. Jimmy was a pioneer, too. As a young man, he went west to seek his fortune in the Rainy River Valley, just being open to settlers. chose for his homestead a riverfront lot near Emo in northwestern Ontario. But he was lonely. In 1887, he asked a new neighbor to fetch him a bride from southern Ontario. Our short acquaintance did not suit me. I want you to get me a woman, rather a wife. Now, I want you to get me a good one. Remember, you will have to live alongside of her. I would like a girl under 27 years, brought up on a farm. Her hair may be any color except fiery red. Not too thundering big. You know what kind of a girl, all right? Myself, at 31, I use no liquor, nor tobacco, nor do I make use of profane language. I can get hundreds to testify to that. I haven't much learning, but I have morality and character to make up. Please oblige your neighbor, James A. McEwitt. The neighbor matched him up with Jane Gibson, 19, good-looking and willing. 
But for some reason, we'll never know, Jimmy backed out. What we do know is that Jimmy cleared the land and worked his homestead alone. He used the logs to build house, barn, and outbuildings. He put up snake fences and grew crops. He survived, even prospered. He gained title to three farms before deciding to move on. Before the turn of the century, he left his homestead, never to return. Irma Gillis's parents bought Jimmy's property. It was a lovely place. My mother dubbed it Bonnie Doon when she came, so they always called it the Bonnie Doon Farm. There was a homesteader's log cabin, a very neat one, built by James McCoot. A well-built, everything he did was well done. The attic of the little log house seemed to be half full of letters scattered all over the place. <laughs> Jimmy turned his back on security to try a different lifestyle, prospecting for gold. The district had been raging with gold fever all through the 1890s, and local mines were producing more gold than all the rest of Ontario. But prospecting failed him. In 1903, he built a log shack on the shore of White Otter Lake. This was near the future site of the castle. To the north and south, railways were funneling thousands of settlers west to homestead the prairies. But Jimmy had finished with farming. He cast his lot with the shields, rocks, water, and trees. He became a trapper, the only person living on White Outer Lake year round. He often canoed north to Ignace, a station on the Canadian Pacific Railway. Cyril Parker grew up there. I was fire ranging at the time and traveling on the lake there, and every time we come by, of course, we have seen Jimmy, so maybe see him once a week or twice a week or whatever, every time we're passing there. I knew him from visiting in Ignis, too, when he'd come in for his supplies, when he'd come in for groceries or his mail or whatever, and all the kids knew him, and everybody in town did. He was only a small man. He wasn't by any means or muscular in any way. A quiet sort of a fellow in his own way. Yeah, I was only a young fellow at that time, 1916. I was only a little over 14 years old. Old Jimmy come up to rope my shoulder. He took quite a shine to me. He thought I was all right. The 30-mile trip to Ignace took more than a day each way, in favorable weather. There were 18 carrying places. The worst, a hill at the height of land called Mountain Portage. Nobody knows just when Jimmy decided to build the castle. But it was long before the First World War broke out in 1914. Construction took a long time. First, he cut Norway pines from the beautiful stand near his shack. Then he limbed each tree and winched the logs to the site before he began hewing and dovetailing them to form the walls. He also had to set in the windows, chink between the logs, and whipsaw lumber for the roof floors and doors. Oh, they were quite thick, you know, and they're huge on one side, squared on the inside, and notched and dropped into one another. And then slide up the pole or whatever onto the top of the building, you see. But after they get up, you know, over his head, where he couldn't begin to lift them, he had trays with a rope on it, and put it over a Passed it up on the top of the log, as high as it'd be, and dropped the rope down onto the log on the ground and tie it. And then put rocks in it, so it weighed more than the log, and then up it would go. He'd notch it after he got done the top and drop it into place. It was marvelous to think that one man put this building up 
That's, that's more than I can do to pitch a tent. <laughs> Jimmy lived in the back section, which gave him plenty of room. The main section is big as a barn. 28 logs set one upon another to the peak of the roof. Almost 100 logs in all. The back section was built the same way, but the tower was a little different. The logs were about 10 inches thick, and he just split them right down the middle, you know, and make two logs out of one. The tower was 40 feet high. By climbing stairs to the top floor, Jimmy could spot animals moving through his domain, and people. His solitude had ended in 1912 when a logging company moved in to cut pine for lumber. The company built several cutting camps along the shoreline and a main supply camp to the south at Flanders on the Canadian National Railway. Jimmy began bringing in his supplies over the company's ice road. Now there were more people living and working on White Otter Lake than ever before. Jimmy found he had to build a shed to protect his tools and equipment. Ever since his arrival, Jimmy had lived in harmony with his surroundings. He trapped no more than was necessary to support his simple lifestyle. Jimmy, like his castle, blended with the landscape rather than trying to subdue it. But the newcomers brought sweeping change. Trees in large numbers were cut in winter and towed across the lake in summer. A dam was built in order to raise the water level and drive the logs downstream to the sawmill, but ironically, it was all in vain. People still call it the lost drive. The dam affected Jimmy, too. Three years of high water left its mark along the shoreline. Waves washed right over Jimmy's beach. The water was dirty with bark. During the spring breakup, the castle's foundation was encased in ice. Jimmy yearned for the power to control the destiny of his masterpiece. He decided to try buying the land, even though it had not been open to settlers. He had a surveyor come from Kenora to run the lines. Then he applied for title. He paddled to Ignace several times that summer to use the post office. But the answer to his request was a crushing no. The official letter questioned his right to settle there at all let alone have a survey done. The castle stood within the timber limit. The letter offered one slender ray of hope. The land department kept his deposit and sent him back a receipt. Jimmy continued his life as usual. Grace Petterson grew up on a nearby lake where her father was a commercial fisherman. She and her sister liked to visit with Jimmy. But I remember he used to make his candy with the sugar, and he, he put a little bit of sand in the candy, and he said that was good for us children to have a little bit of sand in our candy. <laughs> he might have just said that. I don't know. One winter, he traveled all the way to Fort Francis to visit friends who lost their belongings in a house fire. He bought blankets and dishes for the new home. On another occasion, he shared precious lemons with the journalist Hodson. Jimmy graciously served him ice-chilled lemonade in the heat of the summer. Mr. Hodson found Jimmy a fascinating companion. What interesting tales of woods life can this old nature lover tell? How the keen eyes sparkle, and the tanned face beams as he guides us to a tiny lake and shows a wonderful beaver house more than six feet high. Jimmy was fairly self-sufficient. He baked bread and split firewood. He grew a vegetable garden, later fencing it in to keep the deer out. He often fished with hook and line. In the fall, he used a net to catch enough lake trout to see him through the winter. He grew rhubarb and picked berries. What few staples were needed, flour, sugar, oatmeal, he bought with money earned through trapping and working as summer watchman at one of the logging camps. But no matter how busy he was, Jimmy always found time for the little extras, like flowers. Oh, he had all kinds of them there. The place was just alive with flowers. There were so many of them. <laughs> he loved the birds, and that's why he never had any cats or anything around his place. He had little places outside where the birds would come to eat. He lived in the back part of his house. And the first part, he had it pretty well 
furnished with bunks that he made. And we asked him why he made so many beds there, and he said, well, he said, when I get married, my wife is going to have lots of company come here. Was Jimmy really planning on getting married, or was he making up stories to entertain the children? In the top of his castle there, he had a little trap door, and he had a place to put his flag out. At the time, in the First World War, there was a, a battalion that left Fort Francis to go overseas to fight. And he took some beautiful flowers out of his garden and packed them in the damp moss. He made a big box, and he had my father build a birch bark horn to call moose with, a moose horn, they used to call him. He had him put that in the, in the top of the box, and, and he shipped it out to Flanders, and it went to Fort Francis to the Bull Moose Battalion before they went away. <laughs> That's why he had him make the horn to call the moose. <laughs> Jimmy offered the castle as a convalescent home for veterans. In a letter to the Ontario Minister of Lands, Forests and Mines, he poured out his pent-up frustrations. I am sending you some pictures of my house and place. I have put it up without any help whatever. Not only that, but the trappers, fire rangers, fishermen, and lumbermen and others were and are on my back. You cannot say that you are not with them. Over three years ago, I sent you down the plans of my place. Also, money for which I have a receipt. The rest is ready to send. I hope you're not too mad to reconsider. The minister did reconsider. The answer offered hope that Jimmy would one day own the land the castle stood on. But time had run out. Well, he used to come to our place for Christmas every year. And he had about 12 miles or something like that to come to our place. But he used to snowshoe over there in the wintertime. He did not appear that Christmas of 1918 or ever again. My father went up to Jimmy's place. He found his water pails were frozen right to the bottom and there hadn't been anyone there for a long time. So he figured that, that Jimmy had really disappeared, that something had happened to him. So in the spring, all the family went up there in this little, this little old inboard motor we had, boat we had. And uh, on our way up there, we met two fire rangers in the canoe. And they said, we found Jimmy's body in the water. And I think his, they said that his, uh, there was a button caught in the net from his coat. And they pulled him into the lake. Jimmy was buried in a coffin made from lumber he had sawn himself. The castle became his headstone. His story might have ended right there if it weren't for the castle. But because he turned his dream into a reality, Jimmy McEwitt lives on through the legend of White Otter Castle.